Good morning. <laughs> yeah, good. Good morning. Good morning. There right. we go. You guys heard me. <laughs> it's good to see everybody this morning. I hope you're ready to jump in to worship. Um, yeah, wake up a little bit. <laughs> We're going to start off with Yes, I Will. So if you guys want to stand or if you want to sit, um, it's up to you. But, you know, sometimes we come in here super excited and ready on a Sunday morning. Sometimes we need to wake ourselves up a little bit. And I know that was kind of me this week. And so this song reminds me of, you know, Psalm 34, where it says, Our pra your praise will continually be on my lips. Not just when we're energized or when we're really happy or we had an awesome week, but when we're tired. Um, and it was a fight to get here. So let's, let's stand up and, and praise God through whatever. Psalm 118, 24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray together. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you've gifted us with an opportunity to gather together, to spend some time worshiping a God who is worthy, the only one and true God, the creator and sustainer of life, who also came to earth and is our Savior and longs to have a relationship with us that we will allow him to be truly Lord of all. So as we gather, let us be mindful that there's a lot more involved than just merely getting in a car and driving to a building, sitting down, standing up, sitting down, standing, praying. Let us be mindful that you are at work to create in us the culmination of your eternal kingdom. Let us never take that lightly. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Cornerstone. We're glad that you're here with us. We exist to fish the Flathead Valley, find people in the midst of their needs, initiate a friendship with them, serve them as Christ serves the church, and help them find hope in Jesus Christ throughout all of eternity. I do have just a few announcements for you, but I want you to be mindful that part of what's happening as we fade a little bit out of winter, how many of you are ready for springtime? Hey, can we, let's turn those lights back on back there. Man, we got to get some light in here, you know. Yeah, let's have them on just for a moment, and then we'll worship again, and we can turn them down so you can see things. But I don't know, I've been seeing some of those nice little plump birds, you know, with the orange belly called, you know, the robins, you know, and they come out and, and been seeing some of the big birds, you know, that are also people eat them, you know, they're, they're the Canadian goose. And so I say that because what's happening is nature is reminding us that a transition is taking place. And you see that nice, wonderful white stuff that makes everything look pure and clean, is fading to the, the drab grass, right, for now. And then we look forward to the day when the grass is green, and then you have to go out and mow. And, uh. But the reality is there should be a transition happening in your heart as well. And so my hope is that God is continuing to grow in you as he continues to allow the seasons to change around us. And so just something to kind of think on. I want to read to you out of Psalm uh, 103 this morning. It says, as for a man, in verse 15 of 103, as for a man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. See, it doesn't matter what a moral relativist believes. God is established his kingdom in heaven and he rules over all. His truth pierces through the clouds, down into this earth, this, this place where the dirt dwellers are, inside of time. But God's purpose is not merely to influence us, but to redeem that which has been lost. And so it's awesome stuff. I found myself this morning in a deep study on some things that we're probably not going to be able to get all to today, but good, good stuff. I just want to remind you that as the snow fades and the grass comes, so also life is coming and going as we live day in, day out. I was reminded of the frailty of life this morning. I became aware of a once young and vibrant man who I worked for for several years that is now no longer here. And so it just reminds you that, man, things are changing. Life is changing. Announcements. Uh, next Saturday brings the second annual Seed Exchange Gardening Fellowship here at Cornerstone. Uh, be here from 10 to noon. Bring seeds and a snack to share. Please see Stacia Martin. Uh, Stacia is right here. Yes, please see Stacia if you're going to be a part or would like to, you know, pre-plan what seeds are needed and in exchange. 
It's time for a new Cornerstone directory. If you're interested in being in the directory, even if you have already previously been in the fellowship hall, please fill out. There's a little uh, card. Some are in the fellowship hall. There were some on chairs. Please fill those out and drop those in the offering box. Look, this is not anything that we want for solic solicitation purposes or anything. It's just a way where we can then follow up and when people want to get to know you or contact you for groups or various things, we have some of that information. Simply come as next Sunday, March 26th at 6. So be here, and I believe that's when the Mexico team will be returning, if I'm correct, somewhere around that time. So Resurrection Sunday is April 9th. Please plan to join us here at 9 for a light fellowship breakfast. On Resurrection Sunday, we're going to ask that if you're somebody who gathers here, that you would sit towards the front, because I know that we'll probably need that to happen. I appreciate some of you already parking where I'm parking over across the street. That's wonderful. We don't expect people to park there. If you're comfortable parking there, that's great. If not, park wherever. I just know by the time the sun comes and melts this snow away and it makes the ground nice and soft. We won't be able to be parking necessarily out on the grass then. And so I know there are people battling illnesses, and if it continues, we'll be able to roll through, but we're going to see, hopefully, we're going to have a little more space by then, uh, Lord willing. We're hosting an intruder awareness slash response training on April 22nd. If you're interested in, in attending, please see Dave Lowitz. Dave is normally back there, but you can see Caleb, and Caleb will get you to Dave, or even Brian can get you to Dave as well for price and details. Uh, ladies, please join us. Sorry, not me. Ladies, please join all the other ladies for the fourth annual Cornerstone Ladies Retreat, June 22nd through 25th at Dickey Lake Campground. I think Don created a trap for me there. Please join us anyway. So uh, please see Stephanie Rash. Stephanie was, I think, back there. She may be downstairs or somewhere. Or Whitney, Sarah Whitney. Oh, Sarah's back here. Okay, good. <laughs> Wonderful. Please see them if you'd like to sign up for that. One of the things, just a thought, I hope that it continues to resonate somewhat in your heart. You know, we say it a lot, if you have a pulse, you have a purpose. And I think oftentimes the purpose of life gets a little bit swallowed up in the process of life. <laughs> you know, we, our purpose becomes buried in, oh man, now the snow's melting and I've got water running off and I've got to go, uh, you know, create a way to drain the water. Or, or now I've got to find a way to keep things cold that I had outside or fill in the blank, whatever it is, the mud or whatever. And, and I want to just remind you, God never stops working. In whatever situation you find yourself, God is there. So in the frustration, in the excitement, just be mindful He's at work. Amen? Let's worship together.
much will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every heart proclaim the mercy of your name on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Praise you. 
that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great
broken sinner without something being sacrificed because we enter into the very form and make of God. He became God, Emmanuel. He, he became God in the flesh. baptism to some other place or another plan for this afternoon or later this week, but that we will drill down and really keep our focus and our eyes fixed on you. Lord, we do pray for those that are battling, battling various illnesses. We pray for those that are watching and we just ask that you have many sinners at home who are blessed with healing of the body. We pray for Lance Joe Nicholson and others who are traveling and we know that you're traveling with them and all those that are kiddos will be dismissed now. Take a moment and greet somebody that you have not yet greeted and let them know they are loved by God today. I am off, but I'm not off. Check, test, one, two, check, test, one, two. I have, just so you know, I have been working with Brian. I know that sometimes I'm way too loud, and so we've been trying to adjust that. And however my headset was on, this is, ooh, ooh, yikes. Um, I trust that Brian's going to get it adjusted as needed. We continue on our journey of in pursuit through the book of Acts, and we're going to take a very large bite off today just because it was hard as I studied through over the past couple weeks. It's hard to pare it down and then break it apart and then not have what's behind it. It's not necessarily merely self-explanatory, but the text flows well together, and so I felt like it would be 
almost knee-jerk or shifting a manual transmission for the first time if we just broke it apart. Rather, I want to have a smooth transition. We're in Acts chapter 15. We're going to be picking up in verse 1. And rather than reading through the text and then coming back to it, we're going to read through it and we're going to break it down as we go because it is a large amount of text and it lends itself very easily to a hermeneutic that is broken down almost as we go in a step-by-step process. Not everything in Scripture is easily engineered. And in actual reality, we grow organically in the Lord. And this is important because part of the text that we're dealing with has to do with truth, its application to our lives, how it affects us, how it influences us, what it affects in society as a whole, and what we do with that. See, the only thing, ultimately, we have no control. God is sovereign. Yes, we can choose the Lord, and we need to walk in His direction. We need to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But more more or less, we're dealing with a reaction to an action that's already taken place. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Later on, John continues to say, I would that none should perish, but that all would come to eternal life. And yet, people don't like the light. They want to be in the darkness. The reality, though, is because of God's action... To redeem his creation, we have a choice and a reaction to receive what Jesus did on the cross or not. Very similar to what we're talking about in Acts chapter 15. See, Paul and Barnabas had went out. They had actually went up into the area of Galatia, and we've looked at maps in the past. We're not doing that today, but if you look at a map sometime, Iconium, Derby and Lystra are found in the area of Galatia, which is Asia Minor, somewhat northern, northern Asia Minor. And they'd been out as missionaries seeing Gentiles come to the Lord. Well, when they come back to Antioch, we saw the, the effects of that, verse 27. And when they arrived and gathered, this is Acts 14:27. When they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with the disciples. And so that was an exciting reunion, if you will, for them to come back. There's great excitement. The Gentiles are coming to the Lord. And now there's a question of truth. We're dealing with a question of truth. What is the true gospel? And this is where the Jerusalem Council gets involved in this. In verse 15, chapter 1 says, sorry, chapter 15, verse 1 says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. I want to stop here for a moment. This is bigger than a mere physical altercation. Circumcision, okay? This is a larger issue. This is Jesus plus, which means it's not Jesus only. Okay, look at your neighbor and say, Jesus plus is not Jesus only. Now, the question is, do you agree with that statement? So in what we're talking about, Paul is going to be fleshing out, and Galatians will be there here in just a moment, Galatians chapter 1. But I want you to see what he's laying out and what he's, what he's going to be telling them is when you provoke or force someone to make an action to earn a salvation that is only to be received by faith, in Christ alone, what you're saying is Christ is not all we need anymore. Now, I believe that we're pretty much united in this front. You know, part of the reason why 
I want to be a part of the church of God is the church of God was going to and should still be longing to uphold the Word of God. Now, I'm not going to lie. There are some areas where national is stepping in different directions, but in the church of God, we have autonomy. Therefore, we can step in God's direction and maintain the truth that we find in Scripture, whether or not anybody else is in agreement with that. Now, with that comes an accountability that's needed from my brothers and sisters here at Cornerstone. How does that accountability work? Very similar to that of the Bereans in, the, in Scripture. If I am saying or trying to mislead or teach you something that is not found in Scripture, I need to be held accountable for that. Somebody needs to come to me and say, Hey, Pastor, you mentioned this or you said that. I'm wondering if that's right. Is that correct? Is that not? That is how things should happen. And this is somewhat what's happening in Acts 15, but it's a heretical teaching that's being followed up because they're trying to force upon them a legalistic action that then would bring and allow the faith that they have to be one received or looked upon by the Jews as something that now they're a part of. I know <laughs> it's kind of hard to track with, but I'm, let's just continue here and we'll break it down a little. Verse 2 says, And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So let me back up a little. They had returned to Antioch. People are coming from Jerusalem saying, Wait a minute. Not only do they need Jesus, they need to be circumcised as well. So this is the Jesus plus. So they're like, Wait a minute. We're going down here. We're going to set these people in Jerusalem straight. So verse 3, so being sent on their way by the church, this means they had the support of the church that was around them. They passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. I love it that even in the midst of this false teaching, they're continuing to do what? They're teaching the truth. They're taking the word of God as missionaries to the people that will hear the truth of God's Word. We cannot ever stop teaching the truth. We are called by God to be truth bearers. We're called to be men and women that long to see God's Word upheld, even to our own demise. I say demise because if someone should choose to take my life over the truth, I am still to be one who bears the truth. And so are you as one who believes in Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, today is the day. Now is the time of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. We can talk after. Verse 4 then says, When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Now, we're going to stop here a moment between verse 5 and 6, and we're going to go over to Galatians chapter 1, because somewhere along the line, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Galatia, and it's believed this letter went to the church prior to his arrival in Jerusalem for the Jerusalem council. Okay, so I want you to see as history is being played out through what's taking place, Paul wrote this church, this letter to the churches in Galatia before or right before the Jerusalem Council, which is believed the Jerusalem Council took place around A.D. 48 or 49. So here's what Paul wrote to the church in Galatia regarding the testimony that came to him at Antioch with what was happening in Jerusalem. So he writes a letter in response, starting in Galatians 1, verse 6. Okay, Galatians 1, verse 6. Keep your finger in Acts 6, because it's important too. Galatians 1, verse 6 says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Folks, this is still happening today. 
It's still happening today. Yeah, oh, you go to church, oh, you believe Jesus Christ saved you. Well, you need to do this. Well, Jesus is my Savior. Yeah, but you ought to do that. Well, Jesus is my Savior. Well, but we're to keep all the... Well, Jesus is my Savior. Now, understand, Hebrews had not yet been written for everybody to reflect upon from the Jerusalem Council on down, okay? So we have an advantage over all of these people that are going through this, but this is part of what I think provoked a lot of the other books of the Bible as we read them. But verse 8 says, so important. Paul says with the church in Galatia, remember he had been stoned there, and this is what he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. He doesn't stop there. As we have said before, so now I say to you again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For I am now seeking for, sorry, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Now the Pharisees were all about the approval of man. How do you feel about yourself? How flowing is your robe? You have your phylacteries fixed right on your forehead. All these or, and he continues, he says, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. What Paul's saying here is, remember, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I was one who was looked upon as one who was highly, uh, basically, um, favored, if you will, or under Gamaliel. He was one who was very well known. He had the status that one would want. And so he comes as one saying, wait a minute. Hey, if, if I knew that it was about pleasing men, I would not be a Christian myself. What Paul's saying is, if I merely wanted to please men, I could have stayed a Pharisee. But remember, the road to Damascus changed his life. Why? Because he saw Jesus, he heard Jesus, he had a revelation, he had an experience, and then from there on, the transformation continues to take place in his life. He has changed, he is new. Now go back to Acts chapter 15, verse 6. So there's a problem, there's a, there's a great troubling problem over this Jesus plus idea. Verse 6 says, The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. So what Peter's saying is, look, faith is what cleansed their heart so that they could receive the Holy Spirit. Not an action, not circumcision, not following the legalistic Mosaic law, but faith in and of itself made them then worthy to receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 9 says, and he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Verse 10. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. So what Peter's saying is, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We can't weigh them down with the legalistic laws of the Levitical Code, the Mosaic Law, if you will, that followed up with the Levitical Code after they have received by faith the Holy Spirit given by God. Why would we test God in this? God knows what's right, okay? So this is a problem. Now there's going to be a proposal here, verse 12. Then all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So I look at this as Paul and Barnabas are then building upon the foundation that Peter laid of saying, wait a minute, they've received the Holy Spirit. They have, by faith, 
been found worthy of the Holy Spirit. And now Paul and Barnabas were saying, yes, and to prove this out, God did many, many, many miraculous things around and through the Gentiles on our missionary journey. Okay, are you with me? Now let's continue here. Verse 13 then says, after they finished speaking, James replied. This is huge. This is not the James who's been murdered. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to reply. Okay. This is James, the brother. It's not James the less. This is James, the brother of Jesus. Now, in and of itself, this is an issue because there are many that wanted to make Mary a virgin forever. But Joseph and Mary had other children. And so James is one who, it's amazing, he's the one now who early on didn't receive Jesus, but now he is a believer in Jesus Christ, and so he becomes the head of the Jerusalem church. And you'll see here, the guy is smart. He has a great proposal for them, so let's read here. Now, I want you to write down, because when we get down to verse 16, I'm not going to stop there necessarily, but you can write in your notes, Amos 9, 11. Amos 9.11 refers to verse 16. We're going to go to Jeremiah briefly, Jeremiah 12, 14 through 17, but also Isaiah 43, 7 deals with verse 17. But I say that to say this, there is a continued connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can't just roll up the Old Testament and throw it away because we're now saved by faith. We can learn from the Old Testament. We need to learn from the Old Testament. The Old Testament points us through prophecy to the New Testament and beyond. Okay? Now, let's continue here. James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will, re I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, who says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. So James points us to the past. So turn over to Jeremiah chapter 12 starting in verse 14, Jeremiah 12. Now, if you remember, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. God downloads a whole lot of information to Jeremiah regarding the sin of the people, how they had fallen into great idolatry, and basically how God's going to go through the process of rescuing them to Jeremiah's frustration, and often it points anger. He is not happy with God's plan as sometimes we aren't either. But Jeremiah still continues to move forward with the Word of God as he should and as we should as well. So Jeremiah verse, chapter 12, starting at verse 14, says, Thus says the Lord concerning all my evil neighbors who touch the heritage that I have given my people Israel to inherit, behold, I will pluck them up from their land, and I will pluck them up from the house of Judah from among them, and after I have plucked them up, I will again have compassion on them, and I will bring them again, each to his heritage and each to his land. And we're in Jeremiah 12, verse 16 now. And it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they should be built up in the midst of my people, verse 17, but if any nation will not listen, then I will utterly pluck it up and destroy it, declares the Lord. What is the prophet Jeremiah saying that God is downloading to him? Basically, it doesn't matter if you're an evil neighbor or not. If you will come to the Lord, if you will change from serving Baal and worshiping him and serving God and worshiping him, then I will preserve you. If you won't, you're in big trouble. Okay? He also included the house of Judah in that. But this is important because God's word reiterates God's word. And this is what James brings to the light of all those in the council. Hey, basically he says, God made a way for the Gentiles before any of us. Okay, God made a way. Now, verse 19. 
James' proposal is basically, <laughs> we are not God. God is, okay? God cannot be coerced or, manip- or controlled. God cannot be manipulated or manhandled. He is, we are not. Complete submission to him is our role. Let go of control. This was an issue for the Pharisees, and guess what? It's not just an issue for them. It's an issue for me today that I let go of control and allow God to have his way in me. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is what we talked about earlier. We don't make the decisions. We react to the decisions that are made by God. He gifts us with opportunities to choose, but our reaction to those gifts of opportunities will result in where we're going to be for eternity. This is a big deal, folks. Yes, it was a big deal for the Jerusalem Council, but it's a big deal even today that we understand God has a plan for all of His creation. Far beyond what we can see, far beyond what we can fathom, we need to let go of control and trust in a relationship with the Lord, trusting Him. Verse 19, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble, this is James still speaking, we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Okay? Now what, what he states here is basically this isn't a go, this isn't Jesus plus. This is because of Jesus. They're not serving anymore those other little g gods. Each thing that's represented there, we don't have time to get into every one of them, but each thing represented had to do with serving another god. Okay? So what does that say to us today? When we believe in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, He is one. We have an audience of one. He is the one God in whom we serve. Amen? We do not bow down to any other. We don't serve the president or a dictator or this person or that. We worship and serve God alone. Alone. And only. Alone. He is God. And only Him. Okay? (laughs) We're going to be lonely if we don't do that. But anyway. He longs to have a relationship with us, but his relationship with us demands that we remain faithful unto him. And this is part of the holiness that Peter talks about. Be holy as I am holy. There's a process that we're to run into the light and flee from the darkness. And so the reality is this is the transformation that we talked about at the very beginning, how around us. There's a transformation happening on earth as the seasons change. So also there should be a heart transformation taking place in our hearts. And this is where Jesus talks about circumcision, not of the flesh, but of the heart, cutting away the dross, no longer worshiping even ourselves or other gods, but worshiping God alone. Okay, so verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and to the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch. With Paul and Barnabas, they sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter, Brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are in the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instruction, it seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men, verse 26, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit 
and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these, than these requirements, but that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Pretty simple. Very true. Verse 30. So when they, sent, when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of, its, because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were there themselves, pro, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. Uh, and after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. We're going to get into part of the end of 15 next week, but I'd like you to turn in your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There's something important that I want you to see. There's something that ties into the, the, basically the change, if you will, the command that they gave. It's something that I think we need to understand. It's how we bring this right around to where we are today. And I want to start in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 6, and then I want, back, I want to back up to verse 12 because I think it's so important. Look, we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about heretical views and heresies that are found throughout the world, but we need to be mindful that Hebrews, 12, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 tell us, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who, of who, to whom we must give account. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. You need to write that down because Hebrews 12, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 is the remedy against heresy. We go to God's word. We need to be Bereans. We need to be searching the scripture. But I go back now to 1 Corinthians 6 where I asked you to turn. And I want to read to you verse 19. It says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So what provokes Paul to say this to the church at Corinth? Back up to verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but, the, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Verse 14, And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Verse 18 then says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. You say, Pastor, why do you take me to this? Because 19 reminds us, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Remember, Peter said, the Holy Spirit was given to the Gentiles. And then Paul and Barnabas reminded and said, yes, and the Holy Spirit did miracles among the Gentiles through us. And so the key component throughout the text of Scripture is not necessarily any man or woman, but the presence and working of the Holy Spirit in us. And as we're joined together with Christ through the working of the Holy Spirit, we need to be mindful that we are not our own. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit from within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now, we also know, and we, we love this, that God gives us a way out. You can write this down in your notes. 
I'll just turn there briefly. I wasn't planning on going there, but it's important because it's, it's also a key to the process of remaining pure. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, as the worship team comes, I want to tie some things up. Very similar to Paul and Barnabas, we live in a day now where moral relativity is popular and growing. I don't have time to go into that. If you want to talk about it, I'd love to sit down sometime and go through some of it with you. But to just sum it up for you, moral relativity finds itself very similar to what happened in the book of Judges when Men and women did what was right in their own eyes. Okay, their authority was not found in Scripture. Their authority was found in how they felt. Their authority was found in if they considered it to be true, then it must be true whether or not it was true and is true. Okay, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is to be received by faith And it is found that Jesus only is the requirement needed for our salvation, not Jesus plus. You can write down in your notes the book of Colossians. It goes through and bears out how sufficient Jesus Christ is as our one and only Savior. Now, I say that to say this. False beliefs lead to a false gospel promoting a false God. False beliefs lead to a false gospel promoting a false God. Now, I'm going to use just one example quickly so that you understand and can kind of trace with this. There is now a move, and there's even a church being planted, at least that's what I was made aware of, that believes in modalism. Okay? Modalism is basically how you take God and break him down into the understanding of three modes, okay? Very similar to water. You have liquid, vapor, and solid ice, okay? The problem with this is that is not God, okay? It's not God. Now, a modalist will explain to you that because God functions this way, this way, this way, they then give themselves clout and how the Holy Spirit would function through them, and they say, well, that was then, this is now. Well, I'm telling you that if the Holy Spirit didn't function that way then, He's not functioning that way now. And so I say that to say this, God the Father is God our Creator. Jesus Christ the Son is God with us Emmanuel, the Holy Spirit, He is God also. They are not three, they are, yes, the Trinity, three in one, but they are all three separate entities. They're not just in a different mode. Okay, we don't have time to go into the text, but wouldn't it be kind of weird if you're talking to a modalist about then how does it work when Jesus is being baptized and the voice comes from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased? Well, a modalist will say, well, I don't know. Maybe there's a microphone up there, something planted in the clouds. I don't know. But the reality is this. We have to allow God's word to be the truth that we trust as our authority. And it must always be that way. And look, there are things that I can tell you in God's Word that I don't fully understand. I would love to sit down. If there are things that you're not understanding, let's talk through it together. I do not claim to know it all at all. I do not claim to know it all at all. But one thing I do know is I will rest on the truth in God's Word. And that's what I challenge you to do. And be mindful, our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do not defy your body. Men and women, there are movements in this nation 
pornography. There are things going on in the world around us that can get in your mind and totally distract you from what God has for you. Don't let it happen. Let nothing be dominant over you, but let God be the one who you continue to rest in. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. But we can be dominated by someone, and that is God. Let him be the one who you rest in. Let's stand together.
So I titled this message, Fractured for Truth's Sake. You see, the fracture that continues to spread the gospel throughout the book of Acts and even into our day today requires men and women to stand up on the truth. And I'm going to I'm going to confess something to you today. Okay, I'm going to confess it to you because I want you to be aware of it. I pray for lots of you during the week. I'm not going to say that I pray for every one of you, but God brings many of your faces in to my mind even in my own prayers. I see you standing, I see you reading the Bible, I see I can almost tell you where you sit for whatever reason God does that to me. No, I don't consider them to be nightmares, okay? <laughs> now, what do I pray? My prayer, maybe not in these words, but I pray that God invades your life in such a way that he finds what you're trying to hide and helps you root it out. Why do I pray for that? Because I want that in me. I want that in me. Have I arrived? Absolutely not. I am in the process of being set apart for the purposes of God. I'm thankful that God brought me a God-fearing woman, and she speaks into my life regarding lots of different blind spots that I may have. I'm thankful that I have brothers that speak into my life regarding blind spots I have. But ultimately, only God knows that deep, dark closet that you have. And when everybody comes to visit, you open the door and you throw everything in there and you shut the door. I pray the hinges fall off and the door comes open and it falls on you. All that garbage overwhelms you to the point where you have to get on your knees in tears and say, Lord, forgive me for I know not what I do. I need more of you. That's what I want for you. Because it's not about time. It's about eternity. And it's about being transformed more into the image of Jesus Christ. Amen? Do we want that? I want that. And I hope you pray that for me. I hope you get on your knees and say, Lord, invade Pastor Luke. Ruin his day for the kingdom's sake. If it's for the kingdom's sake, we should want it. And that's what I'm saying, the reaction to how God works. We don't get it the way we want, but we can control our reaction to what we get. Amen. Brian, you have a microphone back there? No, I have your microphone. Phil, come up here and pray for us, will you? I'm going to go back there and greet people. You're the close guy today. Man. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank us. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for, for Pastor Luke. Thank you for his word. You know, it's so, um, it's so refreshing, and I, I thank you. We all thank you for the accuracy of the portrayal of, of his word each and every Sunday that we can count on it. And we thank you for the inspiration that, uh, that we get every Sunday and whatever we need, whatever we need our pastor. We love you very much, Father. We're humbled by the fact that you sent your only begotten Son to save all of us. We thank you for your benevolence, your generosity. We thank you for your forgiveness, for your love, your patience. And we bless, or we ask you to bless each and every one of us and all of our family, whether we're here live or online. We love you very much, Father. And we offer all these prayers up in your Son's name and for your glory. Amen. <laughs>